Hello, I'm Julian DeBrower, and welcome to my presentation on deltaic depositional environments. Have you ever been somewhere that a major river meets a larger body of water? I mean, have you ever truly been to such a place? If you have, you probably saw on a map or were told by a local that you were at the river's mouth, delta, or maybe they even referred to it as an estuary. But what do these words mean? To understand these terms, you should probably start by learning what a mouth of a river actually is. The mouth of a river, quite simply put, is where the river meets a larger body of water, where it terminates, or less eloquently, where it dumps into such a body of water. Typically, this is more specifically a river entering the ocean, but mouth can be used to refer to such locations where a river meets a lake as well. Now that we have covered what exactly a mouth of a river is, we can talk about the distance, the difference between an estuary and a delta. A delta is the protruding deposit of fluvial sediment at the mouth of a river that builds outwards into an area of subsidence within a standing body of water over time, mostly from the deposition of additional fluvial sediment. An estuary, on the other hand, is the hydrological and biological environment that exists at the mouth of the river. That being said, the main difference is that a delta refers to the geological and physical formation that occurs at the mouths of the rivers, while an estuary is merely the biological and hydrological part of the system. To put things yet another way, they can sort of be viewed as two parts to a greater unnamed whole, the estuarial ecosystem and the associate deltaic depositional environment, if you will. This is not to say, however, that all deltas even have estuaries. Deltas that are most strongly influenced by rivers, for instance, often do not have an estuary. Anyways, let's talk about deltas. That's what we're here for. To reiterate and simplify, deltas are the sediment bodies deposited by a river where it meets a standing body of water. Deltas can form in a terrestrial setting, such as where a river meets a lake, like this, where the Salinga River meets Lake Baikal. But most often they are found in a marine setting, where a river meets the sea or an ocean, such as where the Nile River meets the Mediterranean Sea, as shown here. They also tend to be much larger in such locales. Deltas consist primarily of terrigenous fluvial sediment that is clay to sand in size, depending on the force of the water, among other factors. The origin of this settlement varies, but the bulk of it tends to come from mountains and from aquifers in highlands around the river, such as in mountains, where weathering and erosional forces are the strongest. Other sediment, however, is most certainly picked up from the area around the river and from streams that join the river at various points as tributaries. The lithophases of rocks formed in a deltaic setting as such vary in mineralog mineralogical composition, since, mu since much depends on where the sediment originated. However, it is generally true that the sediment found in deltas, particularly the, the delta on the delta front, are mature. Texture is also generally mature to moderately mature. The lithology of the delta deposits include sandstones, conglomerates, and mudstones. It is also worth mentioning that carbonaceous mud can occur in deltas, which can influence the lithology of delta rocks but this is relatively uncommon. However, terrigenous sediment is far from the only thing that ends up being frequently deposited in deltas. Remember how I already described estuaries to you, which commonly coexist with deltas? 
as the sort of biological companion to deltas? Well, when the estuarine organisms die, they will commonly settle into the often gentle waters of the delta, and under the right conditions, will be preserved as fossils. Such estuarine organisms include fish, crustaceans, and insects, among many other animals. Plants are also found in estuaries, but are comparatively less frequently preserved. Even when there isn't a true estuary, deltas are somewhat unique among depositional environments in the sense that they contain marine life, freshwater organisms, and land biotas, organisms that live on the land. The remarkable biodiversity associated with deltas makes them interesting because the rock that forms in such environments often contain radically different animals in terms of lifestyle, preserved in relatively close proximity. For example, the Maison Creek Lagerstadt of northeastern central Illinois is believed to have had a deltaic paleo environment and the fossils vary radically. It is flush with a myriad of various fossils of organisms that lived there in the middle Pennsylvania epoch of the Carboniferous period. They vary from marine organisms such as jellyfish medusae, like Essexella, which is pictured here on the left, and the enigmatic Tully monstrum, also known as the Tully monster, to land organisms like various arachnids and insects, as well as a large variety of exceptionally preserved plants. And that is by no means an exhaustive list of the seriously wild and huge variety of organisms that are found in the Maison Creek fossils. As far as ichnophases go, there are several notable trace fossils that get preserved in deltaic environments. For instance, there is often burrowing and bioturbation in the sediment of deltas because the water moves relatively slow and it's easy for animals to live there. There are several parts of the delta. The first part of the delta that is considered to be separate from the river is the delta top, which is sometimes instead referred to as the delta plain. It is at these plains where the river breaks commonly into multiple branches that flow across the top. These branches are called distributary channels and together they flow across the delta's floodplain. If these channels lead to the delta top consisting of separate lobes, sometimes an inner distributary bay can form. An inner distributary bay is a sheltered area of low energy sedimentation between the lobes of the delta. The other major part of a delta is the delta front. The front consists of the mouth bar, the locations where the coarsest sediment is deposited directly at the channel mouths. Beyond the mouth bars lies the delta slope. The slope is generally not super steep, except when grains are particularly coarse. Starting at the delta slope, finer sediment grains are deposited going outward further into the standing body of water. Beyond the slope is the pro-delta. The pro-delta is the final transition between coastal deltas and marine shelves and is where the finest muds are deposited within the delta. The slow moving water that is common of deltas also commonly leads to the formation of swamps, marshes, and bayous. The most famous American delta, the Mississippi, is well known for its associated bayous, such as the Bayou Teke, which was formed as part of the Mississippi Delta. But the Mississippi Delta gradually shifted away due to deltaic switching, a natural process by which deltas change their course over time. 
Deltas are acted upon by three major defining forces that influence their formation as well as the facies of the rocks that would be formed at a given delta over time. These major processes are waves, tides, and currents or rivers. Deltas are classified based upon how much of each of these individual factors influenced their given formation. Did you notice how I said how much rivers, tides, and waves influence the formation of a delta? That is because there is a continuum between each of these actors. This continuum is commonly illustrated on ternary diagrams as a means of visually sorting the different morphologies of deltas based upon the influence of these three major processes. Furthermore, the plotting of this continuum allows for us to make educated guesses about how brackish the water is at various deltas, as well as how still the water might be. Um, um, beyond that, it also helps tell what sort of shape the delta will take. First, let's go ahead and talk about river-influenced deltas. River-influenced deltas, such as the Mississippi River Delta, are where tidal and wave influence are insignificant. These deltas tend to have fairly minor slopes that dip at one degree or less that form from small sediment particles that get carried in suspension until flocculation. River-influenced deltas commonly produce mudstones and sometimes show ripple marks closer to the mouth of the river. Another type of delta Gilbert deltas are another type of river-dominated delta where grains tend to be much coarser. As a result, the slopes of Gilbert deltas are also significantly steeper, about 10 times as steep. Wave-dominated deltas are characterized by the tendency of strong waves altering the sediment under the water. Mouth bar deposits tend to be well sorted under the influence of wave domination. Progradation also happens under the influence of wave dominated deltas because sediment is not all transported away from the mouth due to the waves as a result. Mouth bars form as a result of the progradation. As such, mouth bars are often well developed in wave dominated deltas. Before we move on, I'd like to briefly introduce to you and explain another topic, progradation. Progradation is the growth of a delta into the standing body of water due to the deposition of new sediment. Progradation adds on to the delta and is most commonly caused by a decline in sea level or alternatively due to a rapid influx of sediment over a period of time. A sedimentary feature that can occur at such deltas is a wake formed ripple mark. Tidally influenced deltas experience manipulation to both suspended load and bed load. In tidally influenced deltas, occasionally the flow will be reversed in the delta top which can produce cross laminations. This kind of delta has an elongate form of mouth bar that has cross laminations and mud drapes. It is worth mentioning again, however, that all three of these major types of deltas exist on a continuum, and these features can be blended and obscured by mixing influences of these various forces. There is one more type of delta that I intend to mention. A fan delta is a sort of pseudo delta in the sense that it is not fed by a river and is instead the result of an alluvial fan expanding into a standing body of water like a regular delta. Deltas are an interesting depositional environment because of their variety in form and influences, as well as their many associated facies, which comes from being a sort of intermediate environment associated with tidal, fluvial, 
lacustrine, beach and shelf environments and their facies. Hopefully now, if you go or even return to a delta, you will be able to better contextualize, understand, and appreciate the complex processes that went into forming it. And maybe, just maybe, you will even be able to diagnose the influences acting upon the delta. Thank you very much, and please have a good one.